So I'm going to read from my short story collection, Sight Fidelity. And I'm going to start in the middle of a story called The Best Response to Fear. And what I think you need to know is that the characters Bobby and Amy lost their home to foreclosure in the Great Recession. And the story takes place a couple of years later. They are living in an abandoned, crumbling sugar mill that Bobby's parents owned and trying to get their lives back together. They hadn't started eating the rabbits because they liked the flavor exactly. It's just that things had gotten so lean and there were rabbits everywhere. Amy stopped at the store after work, bought paprika, peppers, dried pintos, and they ate the stew together over rice, listening to the radio, which was still like some sort of miracle free. Bobby got used to the gamey flavor of rabbit stew quickly, came to appreciate the way the stringy tendons caught between his teeth. It had taken Amy three attempts at a recipe before she could eat the rabbit stew without gagging. Hot sauce saves the day, she said finally, grimacing. Look, we don't have to eat the rabbits, Bobby said. We could just get a ham hock or something. Maybe not, Amy said, but it's all part of the frugality game, right? What? Bobby asked. The post-recession survival game, Amy said. It's like we get poor people virtue points for any crazy we teach ourselves to tolerate, like eating rabbits out of the yard just because they're free. Bobby had run his hand over Amy's shoulder and down her back, his fingers caressing her shoulder blades, his mind a panic of wings in graceful, frantic migration, his hands searching for a tether. He thought of the misery they'd endured, the missing mortgage payments, the months of wondering how long it would take the bank to come for them, whether they'd take the house in February, in May, in September, the neighbors watching out their windows. Amy had taken it all in stride. Only, only now could he see the traces of bitterness on her characteristic light heart. Now he saw Amy, backlit by the sunrise, walking toward him. He caught a whiff of rabbit before he could see what she was carrying, and he knew she'd found the skins he'd been curing on a rack in one of the sheds. When she was close enough that he could see the worry in her eyes, she handed the pelt to him. What's your plan for these, Bobby? She asked. Her nose wrinkled even as she ran her fingers through one of the furs, touching it in a way that had stopped touching each other. I thought I'd make a coat, Bobby answered. And he looked at him for a long time, as though she was deciding how concerned she had to be. She took a deep breath. She took one of his hands, big, be cool, a blanket, maybe. <laughs> Bobby thought then that it did seem a bit much, a coat handmade from rabbit skins. He'd be likely to wear it even when he wasn't at the mill, and then what? He'd felt for a while now that his instincts about how to live had gone wobbly, that he was drifting slowly out of the community, caught in a riptide of ever-developing eccentricities, interrupted in becoming whatever it was he was going to become, the Great Recession and his own bad choices reacting, like the baking soda and 7-Up of his third grade science project. Either thing on its own benign, uninteresting, but erupting in combination, leaving a sticky coating all over his life, flies buzzing and biting. It took so much effort to do even simple things, to just exist. He wanted to bounce back, to believe in an inevitable recovery, but the world did not feel particularly elastic. Amy surprised him then, put both her arms around his shoulders, pulled herself close to him, and he held her around her waist, closed his eyes, felt the heat of her breath spread across his neck. He let the rabbit skin drop to the ground. Amy pulled back. Bobby, she said, you keep making all this into something it's not, like it's the end of everything, like we'll never recover, and I can't, I'm gonna need you to buck up a little, okay? I'll try, I will. Bobby pulled her into a close embrace, caught the flash of the metal roof of the processing building behind her. Grief, lovely, light like the spark of his father's old art welder, the kind of light Bobby knew better than to look at directly, beauty that could sear his retinas. He felt the warmth of his wife pass, close to skin, skin to muscle, muscle to bone, bone to cells, and he felt himself absorbent, porous, greedy for more. Thank you.
I'm going to read from my new book, What If We Were Somewhere Else. It is a collection of linked short stories set mostly in Denver, though the title, com the title uh, image references a journey to the moon, but the people are from Denver. And the story I'm going to read from tonight, because I think it is appropriate to our weather, is called Tornado Watch. <laughs> in our home, there were sounds. One of the sounds was like a balloon slowly deflating, a sound of almost nothing, of air being displaced. And I'm not sure if we knew it was the canary in the coal mine of our marriage, which we were not paying very much attention to. So we didn't worry about it in particular. We only complained about the unplaceable noise. We checked the fridge and all of the other major appliances. We checked the HVAC system. We poked around outside the house and found nothing. We would kept hearing the slow, gentle whooshing, punctuating occasionally by a squeak. We're paying on the mortgage, so I think we have some right to get whatever this is fixed, Jimmy, my husband, and I said to one another. We fiddled with the thermostat and took a flashlight to the crawl space, and we called our insurance company, who kept wanting to know if we were, <clears throat> excuse me, opening a claim and we kept saying that we weren't sure. We weren't sure what was wrong. We were just trying to understand if we were covered. We didn't know why it was so complicated. We were married to one another, and we were also married to work, and we were married to our, our, our ideas, our ridiculous ideas, so caught up in the way laundry was folded or aspirational grocery lists. Most nights, the produce rotted as we could produce. If we were drunk enough, we didn't hear anything until finally that balloon must have released the final knees all at once, sputtering like a firecracker through our house. Could you please, I'd written with Sharpie on a bright lime sticky on a Tuesday before I left work, the last day Jimmy slept in our bed. Could you please call a plumber, because it might be the plumbing. I didn't know it was the last day then. I didn't know until I came home from work and his own note was pasted on the countertop. Went to my mom's, it said. It wasn't like him to leave a note. Usually he texted. We had met Jimmy and I just over a decade ago. We were both working in an office and he was a contract employee. And when his contract ended, he asked me out. It was surprising. We had barely spoken and he was on a different team. We went on two dates and the balloon filled up so quickly I thought it would pop. It was like a sharp intake of helium sucking the oxygen out of our bodies like we already loved one another so much we couldn't breathe and we were only gasping. We were giddy and high and operating on the upper frequency and we married on our fifth date. We made an impulsive drive to Black Hawk. We both wore jeans, which is what we'd been wearing when we decided to get into Jimmy's car and go. Afterward, we rented a room at a hotel and then lay in the bed and wondered what, just exactly what we'd done. We decided to sell our respective townhomes and get a place together, and we decided we'd really make a go of it. We knew we're, we were being reckless, but we didn't care. And the first year of our marriage was in fact highly administrative, working backward through everything we hadn't done, like announcing our nuptials and getting to know one another in the day to day. What we couldn't explain to people was how much grace our hasty commitment had given us. I wondered if this was what it was like in an arranged marriage. We were already hitched so we didn't have the luxury of enumerating deal breakers because the deal was already done. In our first year, especially, we had to practice acceptance, constant, continuous acceptance. We thought it was a good foundation, at least I did. And really, for how little we knew when we began, we took a long time to let out that last breath for the balloon to finally deflate. The night of Jimmy's note, our life had changed enough that I wasn't sure I wanted to fight for him, so I didn't call. I didn't email, I didn't text. I ordered a pizza and cracked a bottle of wine. I was sure he was not actually at his mom's, and I realized it was certainly not about the plumbing. On our first date, I'd gone back to his place and would had sex on top of his messy bed, and he kept saying to me, open your eyes, and for a while, I did. Thanks. <laughs>
So I'm going to read three chapters, which sounds like a lot, but it's not. If you pick up the book, Gary wrote this book. Every chapter is basically one page of the same number of lines. He just gave himself that little challenge. Uh, this is toward the beginning of the book. The autumn days drifted by. Jeremy did not go to any of his classes. He lay on his couch, staring bleakly at the rejection slip, which he had scotch taped to the wall above him. Why, he whispered, why? For two weeks he had been wallowing in a fantasy that, the, that his epic poem would be, public, be accepted by the publisher and his entire life would be changed. Not only would he achieve a certain amount of local fame and notoriety, but money would begin rolling in. Readers from around the world, especially English professors, would be writing to his publishing house heaping praise on this unknown author and demanding to see more of his work. Outside the wind blew. Autumn leaves were cascading from the trees. Jeremy pondered the fact that it had been three years since he had graduated from high school. His original intention had been to become a big shot novelist within two years after high school and three already had passed. Of course, a year ago he was in the war, so, where, so he hardly could have been expected to write anything. Certainly the literary critics would have had, they would have to take this fact into consideration. He sat up and did some quick mental arithmetic. If I subtract my two years in the Army from the past three years, that means I still have one year left to attain my goal of becoming a big shot novelist. Reinvigorated with, the, with this ambition, he had dashed to his typewriter and rolled a blank sheet of paper through the plate. Flat or plate? Flat? He sat there staring at the keys excitedly. After a while, he began cracking his knuckles and fidgeting. Chapter 18. Jer Jeremy was called into his advisor's office one week later and was asked why he had not been attending his classes. Jeremy wanted to tell the advisor that he had received his worst rejection slip ever and felt that he had earned the right to heap scorn upon the trivial demands of scholarship. But as the excuse took form in his brain, it began to seem sort of weak. In fact, it seemed not unlike the plots of many short stories that he had abandoned. I've been kind of sick, he lied. His advisor frowned at him with suspicion and asked if he drank much alcohol. I tried it once in the army, Jeremy said. That was where he had gotten drunk for the first time in his life. It was also the last time, to date. His advisor then sent him to the campus clinic, where a doctor gave him a physical and asked him to describe the symptoms of his illness. Having never been sick in his life, Jeremy was completely out of his element when he came to lying to a doctor. He decided to tell the doctor that he felt just out of sorts. The doctor frowned with suspicion, then told him to come back if any symptoms happened to re-erupt. Jeremy attended all of his classes the following week, experiencing a sweaty fear that his advisor would receive a suspicious report from the, from the physician, and Jeremy would have to fabricate new lies. But the only consequence was a remark from an English professor who said he was pleased that Mr. Bannister had, at last had decided to grace the classroom with his presence. Chapter 19. While shopping for spaghetti at the supermarket one afternoon, Jeremy spotted a magazine titled Aspiring Writer Magazine. He had never seen this periodical in the campus bookstore, so he stopped to peruse it. His hair almost stood on end when he discovered what it was. The magazine was filled with tips for aspiring writers. He had never known that such a magazine existed anywhere in the world. He felt as if he had uncovered a secret treasure trove that nobody else knew about. He put the magazine into a shopping cart, then stocked up on canned spaghetti. However, when he went up to the cashier to pay for his grocery items, he suddenly became overwhelmed by a nagging sense of embarrassment. While he had never shied away from telling acquaintances about his writing ambitions, the idea of a store cashier knowing exactly what he was up to filled with apprehension. He lifted the magazine from his cart as he got in line and acted like he was merely perusing a periodical that he grabbed from a nearby rack and had no idea what was in it. As the cashier began rigging up items, Jeremy surreptitiously set the magazine next to his cans, then watched the woman out of the corner of his eye and tried hard to control his facial expression. He began mentally concocting some sort of explanation for the presence of the magazine and hoping that the cashier would not make a pointed remark about his writing ambitions. He felt nearly prostrate with relief when the woman finally said, 692. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you so much. I am so honored to have my first poetry book included among all of these wonderful books. Thank you so much, and thank you for being here. This first poem is titled, To Adam from Eve. I eat 18 apples, one for every time. I want to call your name, but close my mouth instead. This is how I learn the slow rot of loss. This is how we become a lesson pressed between gilded pages. In hell, there are seven rooms. In this room, you kiss me once and never again. In this room, there are a hundred paper horses, delicate origami folds. When they try to run, they rip in half. In this room, light scatters in a prism of all colors. Underneath the twinkling fragments sits a letter from you. It says, I love you. Everything will be okay. I am blind. In this room, there is a boat with crisp sails, polished floorboards, just enough room for one. I step in, but there is no water, and I will wait forever in the belly of it. In this room, I am in your image again, once more unquestioning a perfect helper. We embrace and we mean it. This room is not real. In this room, I was a brief mistake. I am placed back in your body, dissolve into you. In this room, it smells like damp spring. Tender saplings line up in rows that stretch farther than I can see. I stoop to pluck them out from the roots. Bunches of limp stems hang from my hands. Nothing will ever grow here again. Go to a coffee shop and think about God and gravity and how they must be the same. Frida taught we are all our, unfold, our own unfolding stories, our own map of the world. You are your own legend. You loved a man with metal teeth and napalm breath, and it's okay, because it will always be okay. Brush the ashes of your chest and take your chain metal heart somewhere else. You are so damn beautiful that you cannot be contained in a glass jar. You are not a model ship for the world to look at. You are a lightning bug caught on a July night, and you would have died in there. This last one um, is called Journey. If I could speak to grief, I would tell him. Lying on a boulder next to Clear Creek, with my fingertips submerged in the current, know that I'm already lost to you. My aloneness here becomes its own fluency, as I forget everyone that I've ever loved and let disappear like a silhouette walking into a fog. As I even forget you, until your name melts off my tongue for good. Nothing ever stops leaving grief. You should know that by now. And this is where I leave you. Maybe there is no such thing as forgiveness. Maybe all we have is journey into places like silent pine forests or fields of columbine where the earth makes up for everything we have ever lost. In these pages, I become the leaves all around me, yellow, orange, red, ready for generous forgetting, for the gentle fall, so someday I can start again. Thank you. I'm going to read just two quick poems and one that's only slightly less quick uh, from my book, We the Jury. And um, how do you talk about the book? I, I think that this is a book that is doing sort of two things. It's, um, you know, we live in this moment where we are, I think, often rewarded for having these kind of, and for performing these kind of certainties. Um, and uh, so I gave myself this task when I was working on this book of trying to write poems uh, only about things that I had 
um, that I really wasn't sure um, how, uh, how I felt about them or what I thought about them. Um, and then I also, for a while now, have been interested in thinking about the ways that our private lives um, do and don't um, come into contact with the public sphere. Um, and so the first of these poems that I'm going to read is, uh, I wrote shortly after the Pulse shooting. Um, and so it's about that. There was in the, in the news shortly after that occurred, there was a newspaper article that talked about um, the, uh, all the telephones in the pockets of all these people who had been murdered uh, all ringing when the EMTs came in, and that just stuck with me. Um, it's called Carillon. Phones were ringing in the pockets of the living and the dead the living stepped carefully among. The whole still room was lit with sound like a switchboard and those who could answer said hello. Then it was just the dead, the living trapped inside their clothes, ringing and ringing them. And this was the best image we had of what made us a nation. Uh, this next poem is a, is a sonnet. It rhymes. You might not hear that, but it does. I promise you. It's called Invention of the Afterlife. When his friend's last notes and letters arrived in a heavy envelope, he found more than a hundred pages bound simply with a rubber band. For three hours, he dragged his mind through the strands of her tight cursive. He was surprised that he recognized almost none of the thoughts and events related there. He'd assumed he would gain a clearer vision of her lost interior, but in the end, so little was revealed, he decided the reading had barely counted even as reading. It was more like combing her hair. And this is a prose poem. Parable of Childhood. When the dog finally died, Dad dug a hole beside the fence and buried her in a boot box. She's gone, but she had a good life, Mom said. It's okay to be sad. Next day, the boy came into the kitchen holding the box in front of him. She's not gone. She's still in there, he said. Look. Mom lifted the lid. Sweetie, when things die, we give them back to the earth. And then we forget them there? Yes and no, Dad replied. He put the box in the hole and covered it over. Together, they walked back to the house. In the morning, the box was on the kitchen counter. I couldn't sleep, the boy said. She was all alone out there. Maybe that's how she wants it to be, Dad replied. No, she doesn't want anything, the boy said. She's dead. But her box was full of air inside the earth that wasn't right. They filled the box with dirt and placed it inside the hole. What does it mean to die, the boy asked. Dad thought of his own father who died a year before the boy was born, a long suffering until at last his body had filled with snow. No one knows what death is, Dad said. I wish I had a better answer for you. Four days passed before the box, heavy with dirt and rot, arrived again inside the house. Why is this here, Dad asked. No one knows what death is, the boy said. I wanted to find out. Jesus, Dad said, and went out to the garage. Mom said gently, no, when things die, they're gone, so we return them to the earth. The dog was gone, that was clear. But the dog was also right there, just below the surface, packed in darkness. The boy could bring her back inside whenever he wanted no matter what his parents said. poetry is um, many different things, but one of the things it is, it's our ticket to travel 
through space and time. And so with that idea, I want to take you to the South Asian country of As Afghanistan. In the year 2001, as you all recall, uh, we had 9-11. And after that, um, our American forces went into Afghanistan and got rid of the Taliban. And that what was followed by a period of hope and peace that Afghan society would be restored to something more open, especially for women. So I'm going to read you. I'm going to take you to, you to the country, South Asia, of Afghanistan in the year 2001. This is called the Return of the Exiles. Under the black turban militants, even, even the migratory birds were unable to sleep at night, disturbed by a ceaseless fire of arms. Guzzles were forbidden, and Kabul's buying follow was no longer heard to recite his, his, his poetry of unrequited love and longing. The Rabal, which is the Afghan lunatic, sat in its corner, strings without a melody, silent as the bat winged, anonymous women's noiseless footfalls, the dawn shrouded poor and maimed, picking their way through the dust and rubble of ruined streets. It was a crime for them to be heard. Nothing grew. Not vineyards, <coughs> nor wheat, nor pomegranates. Nothing grew under the sun. In the land of sands and snows of high Himalayan peaks, but death, dust, and destruction, the blood red poppies in the fields, and the local warlords fear. But now again, after seven, seven long years, guzzles are being sung by singers and musicians, songs to lure back the birds. Exiles returning from the ashes. I should have explained to you a little bit about the Rabab. It's, it's the Afghan loot. And uh, some of the poets here will know what a guzzle is, I'm sure. It's, it's a, a South Asian poetic form. Uh, some, uh, it's made up of interlocking couplets. And it's um, usually sung, and it's uh, about love and the pain of loss. The pain of love and loss. So, puzzle is pronounced with a All right. Um, Can you all hear her? Can you hear me? Can you speak words correctly in the Do you want me to read it again? <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So, um, this is a different, um, a totally different uh, subject, and um, it's suitable for the season, which, you know, we have springtime in the Rockies. So um, I will conclude with that poem. The patience of a scrub oak. Everything is leafing out green in early April, except the scrub oaks who bide their time and wait, patiently, as they know how best. Bare minimalists, gray and skeletal, they are not so easily fooled by Forsythia's premature Eureka shouting gold. Springtime in the Rockies commences with its contabili choirs of birds it's oh to joy light, it's so rich it might be profitably mined. <laughs> okay. 
but it fails, sorry about that, but it fails to indicate that when her base turned back one last time in a flurried storm of white to embrace the high arid plains, the towering purple peaks, why even black bear and her small furry cubs are curled up snugly in their warm, dark den, safe and secure in their ancient knowledge of sleeping in late. But the indigenous rubbles are best of all of judging the e eternal why and when of just how long and patiently to wait. <laughs> Any questions? Thanks for being here. I'm very honored to be in the company of so many other amazing writers uh, and get to, to read some poems. So um, as my my bio said, I'm, I'm originally from North Carolina. I've been in Colorado for 12 years. And so some of these poems that I'll share tonight are are set in, in Colorado and Baker, which is uh, where my family lived when we moved here. So I have high blood pressure, which I found out at what I thought was a shockingly young age. And um, so my doctor told me to get more cardio. So I started going to this, this gym, it's called Hot Mama. So it used to be kind of in Wash Park, but it's on Colfax now, kind of near, near the zoo, sort of. And so this first poem is called Hot Mamas. Hot Mamas, cheerleading tryout flashbacks in the mirror tells me I'm not going to make it. All the women here are white and wearing black stretch pants. Insert photo that appears when Hot Mama's app is open. White lady's torso shaped like an hourglass, belly's curved concave, hip bones jet, no face. The teacher says get a strap, block, mat, three pound weights. Insert photo of four white women at a ballet bar. The music calls us bitches, says bend over, says shut up says keep going. Without the music, we could not keep going. Insert song lyrics. Mask on. Fuck it. Mask off. I have a crush on the teacher. Insert photo of the teacher. Blonde, 5'2", extra small, skull tattoo on her defined bicep. I like to think the teacher is watching me. Of course the teacher is watching me. It's her job to watch. We all like to think someone is watching us. Someone is always watching us. Insert list of Hot Mama's class offerings. Sexy sweat, meet me at the bar, kick your asana, skinny jeans. Every wall here is a mirror. I'm pretty sure the teacher does not like me. I'm pretty sure I'm pretty enough. I am pretty is something we are all trying to think and think that others are thinking when they see us. That we are all white means something we don't have to think about too much. We will all go home and complain about having to make dinner. Dinner will make us fat. Dinner's relentlessness will make us forget our incredible luck. I drive to Whole Foods to get something to make for dinner. Mirrors line the Whole Foods dairy case. Insert Whole Foods receipt. A photo of a half gallon of organic milk. <laughs> This poem is also kind of about Baker. Um, it's called Gentrifier. Gentrifier. Your mind wants to submit evidence against the fact of it. The trailer you grew up in, the outhouse your mother shat in as a child, that one room shack that stands in for the poverty your grandparents endured. The winter wind wailing through thin split walls, the table bare, maybe a bean or two. Yet when you sell your house for a hearty profit to the white couple whose parents are helping them buy it, you know that whatever reasons you had for coming here, 
or leaving here, the case was settled before your birth. The call west was a call to colonize that despite the blood of the enslaved that must be in your veins, in this particular body, the slave owner's blood there prevailed to create a body dotted with brown, though it may be, freckles, more white than anything else, created a white body. The white body watched the neighbors disappear. The white body dreamed distantly of desert massacres. The white body devoted its career to trying to do something good as though that could be an amendment, proof of a good heart, as though history could be amended. The sin is the skin color, the heritage, your albatross. It can't be put down. And then, right on to another poem titled, If I am killed in a mass shooting. If I am killed in a mass shooting, I could have been anywhere, I was there. I am a daughter of this country. I hot rolled my hair. My high school history teacher was a football coach. We never got past the Civil War. The boys had gun racks in their trucks. The deer they hunted hung upside down, dripped blood that formed a pool. We shredded their flesh. It made good barbecue. You light a candle in a vigil. I am a ghost. We are ghosts glancing backwards, looking for men with guns. Know that I wrote this, not to call it in, but as a way to ward it off, a lucky charm. People cry, people cover people with blankets. Flowers cover the sidewalks like blankets. The flowers fade to dust. Do with me whatever you want, America. I am yours. And this is the last short prose poem. The gun in my mother's purse. When my mother was pregnant with me, two men tried to pull her from her car through the half-down window in a Kmart parking lot. She got away. Her purse held a pistol my whole childhood. Be careful with my purse, was one of her mantras. It had the bulk of an animal, came with her to recitals, teacher conferences, Chinese buffet lunches. It sat in the back seat under my sister's dangling feet. Where was it I first learned that purse was slang for vagina? Chaucer? Middle school? A college friend whose mother hated the word? Say pocketbook. <laughs> <laughs>